Well, good afternoon, everyone. I can see that some people are still trickling in, but um, perhaps we should get started. So um, welcome to this latest webinar from the Centre for European Reform. I'm Ian Bond. I'm the Director of Foreign Policy here. And um, well, it's hard to imagine that this could be a, a more timely discussion, really. We're going to be asking whether Europe can live without Russian gas supplies and whether Russia can live without European gas purchases. Um, I, I'll just say that the, the opening remarks in this event will be um, on the record and we'll post them on our website afterwards, but the question and answers will be under the Chatham House rule. And just to remind people, that means that you can use the information that you hear in the Q&A session but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speaker or of any other participant in the meeting can be revealed. So, I mean, in some ways, this, this would have been a timely discussion at any point since 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. Um, and in, over the last year or so, um, well before the resumption of hostilities against Ukraine on February the 24th, We've seen Russia uh, manipulating the gas supply to Europe, uh, resulting in an increase in prices and certainly an increase in European nervousness. Now, the war has raised those prices even further. But the question is, what happens next? Uh, is Europe going to wean itself off Russian gas? Uh, is Russia able to run its economy without European cash? So the, the European Commission has suggested that the EU can reduce its imports of Russian gas by two thirds by the end of this year and stop them entirely by 2027. The, uh, the EU's High Representative for Foreign Policy in justifying this um, pointed out to the European Parliament yesterday that the EU had given a billion euros of military aid to Ukraine, but was paying Russia a billion euros a day for energy. But European leaders, national leaders, have so far shown themselves pretty reluctant to sanction Russian energy exports other than coal, which frankly isn't that significant. So what I hope we can explore today is what the real extent of mutual dependencies is, just how feasible is it for Europe to, to cut its consumption of Russian gas by that amount, and um, just how feasible is it for Russia to, um, to shift its supplies from Europe to, say, China or elsewhere? I, I want to have a look at the politics of this in Europe, and especially in Germany, um, since Germany has for a long time ignored many of its Central European partners, warning it that being too dependent on Russia was a dangerous place to be. And finally, since we want to be quite practical and to look forward, um, I, I think we'll try and look at some of the ways in which Europe might um, move away from dependency on Russian gas and indeed other fossil fuels from Russia, uh, look at the economic impact, and perhaps look at the way in, in which that impact might be mitigated. And I've got three excellent panelists with me, um, well, with me virtually, I should say, uh, each of whom will speak for seven to eight minutes. Uh, so first we'll hear from Katya Yafimova, who is the Senior Research Fellow of the Gas Research Programme at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Then John Luff, who's an Associate Fellow of the Russia and Eurasia Programme at Chatham House. And, um, I suppose, a former colleague of mine from when we were both in Moscow in the mid-1990s, when uh, the prospects for Russia looked rather different from how they look now. And our final speaker will be Elisabetta Cornago, my, currently my colleague here as a senior research fellow at the CER. So, Katya, if I can turn to you first. Can you explain to us um, the extent of the dependencies between Russia and Europe? Um, there's, there's an American phrase that I heard a long time ago that they've got us over the same barrel we've got them over. 
So is that true of Europe and Russia? Um, does either side have alternatives to their current supplier or current purchaser? And if they do, who's more likely to move first? Is it the Europeans sanctioning Russia or is it Russia saying, you know, well, we're not going to supply our enemies any longer? So Katya, why don't you give us seven to eight minutes on that? You're still muted. Sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, yes, indeed, I think that uh, expression really catches uh, the situation uh, very well. It's indeed mutual dependence and mutual addiction, uh, if you like. So it's, it's not really fair to say that one side is hugely asymmetrically dependent on another. It's really significant mutual uh, dependence. Both sides have been locked in and both sides, I think, for, for, for a while, try already and make significant steps to diversify both Europe and Russia. Europe trying to reduce dependence on Russian gas, uh, particularly uh, about 10 years ago, starting after the Ukrainian transit uh, crisis. And lots of steps have been uh, made with various degrees uh, of success. And also uh, Russia tried to diversify uh, east with pipelines uh, towards China uh, so far from completely different uh, resource uh, base, obviously the Western uh, and the Yamal Peninsula overlooking uh, towards uh, Europe and the uh, Eastern Siberia overlooking towards um, China. And at present, those two resource bases are not physically connected, but that may and, and likely to change in the coming uh, years. So in terms of a uh, bit of figures is really Europe dependent about 30 plus, depending, you know, how you define Europe, you know, et cetera. So it's 35, about 35% uh, percent dependence. Uh, it's Russian gas in European supply and Russian budget, uh, basically about 15% of Russian budget um, comes from uh, sales of uh, gas. So oil and oil products come as far larger source, uh, obviously, but uh, it's, 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 you know, because uh, gas, particularly pipeline gas, why it's so uh, important because it's, it's delivered through inflexible infrastructure. It's not like, um, much less flexible, obviously, than LNG, because if you've got pipeline built, it already connects the supplier and the buyer, and, uh, and that's how these interdependence are developed to, you know, from commercial point of view, to mutual benefit, one, one must uh, say. And for 50 decades, I think it's, it's important to stress, it, it, particularly in the current situation, that for 50 decades, that was a very reliable um, relationship which survived, you know, it's been reliable during Soviet time, during the Cold War, during the post-Soviet uh, period, uh, etc. So that a long term, and it's by it's no mean uh, feat really, 50% uh, uh, of 50 years of reliable uh, relationship. And I think a question of, um, you know, just to also to make a very graphic uh, representation, uh, and our institute done some uh, modeling uh, is if Europe were to lose uh, all of its Russian uh, imports from uh, Russia all at once, uh, you know, that would have uh, basically uh, lead to Europe facing the next winter season with a fairly empty uh, storage simply because it's no alternative gas uh, sources available to, to change the picture because it's a very short term is about several months uh, in summer during which to refill storage. And if you exclude Russian gas from that, whoever side, uh, whichever side makes the first step, it's just impossible to fill storages before the winter. And, and the shortage is so significant that it's bound to mean, particularly in the continent, I might say in Germany, in Central Europe, that would uh, definitely mean physical gas uh, shortages. That would mean uh, industries, some industries closing. That would pot potentially uh, mean um, blackouts. For the UK, I think picture would be very different because very little physical dependence on, on Russian uh, gas, but UK is price sensitive. So whatever's happening in the continent, if the continental market becomes very tight, and obviously physical security uh, shortage type market would translate in very high price. And that will almost immediately uh, translate into the, um, sorry, into the high price um, environment in the UK because of the interconnections and it's the, effectively uh, still the same uh, common um, market. So that's very important to bear in mind really because it's, it, it's, it's really a, a big um, thing. It's more physical gas security issue for the continent, more of a price security issue um, 
for, for the UK. And the last question to address in, in the remaining minute uh, or so is really um, who's going to, to cut uh, whom uh, first and where any, any cuts really will be. I mean, obviously, the picture kind of changed now because for many years, the talk in Europe was uh, what if uh, Russia uses uh, the so-called gas weapon the notion, which I personally never quite understood and it never been uh, uh, well defined, I thought, but the question was whether Russia at some point will cut gas uh, to Europe. Now you have sort of symmetrically uh, opposing picture is now you, you, you hear in increased conversations on whether Europe uh, might uh, refuse um, importing uh, Russian gas and the various scenarios it's whether uh, an embargo or whether it's taking the gas but withholding the payment basically putting it onto i think i've just read about uh, today this this notion came up again pay, putting those money to escrow account which effectively would mean that that, that money would not reach gasprom's account and then that means contracts would not be fulfilled and that means um, you know a clear a clear case uh, uh, and a possibility to uh, Europe not receiving uh, the gas because that would be a contractual violation or also another option that was discussed is about uh, cutting certain banks from SWIFT and so far the banks which handled the transactions for, for Russian gas were not cut off, off SWIFT but if there would be that's the same thing that would mean impossibility to make payment and obviously if, uh, under any contract if there is no payment uh, there is no gas so and uh, and it's very interesting, uh, a final point, that um, we're no longer talking about uh, Russia cutting Europe off. We're essentially also talking about uh, Europe cutting uh, Russia off. And we're kind of weighing that the chances of anything, uh, uh, any of this um, happening. And again, the third option, you know, the third way that that gets resolved without, without um, this uh, happening. So despite all the dramatic political, uh, military, uh, trade war, effectively as well, uh, tension. It, it, it's possible that gas relationship, you know, sort of gets preserved to to a to a degree. Not not going to be the same as before, obviously. But I think it's very much an open question in which shape and and, and whether and in which shape it will survive the current um, crisis. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, one uh, uh, since Hendrik Seip has posted this in the in the chat even now, let me just very quickly um, ask you that fifteen percent figure for um, the percentage of the Russian budget from gas revenues is that at at current prices? Um, that's so for, that yeah, that's for the past of, year. That on average right, for the past so year, it would be more now. Yeah, clearly it would be more because prices yeah. sharply up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I guess the oil price has also gone up. So, yeah. you know, provided that Russia can continue to sell these products, it's actually looking at a better budget position than one might suppose. Okay, interesting. Well, John, if I can turn to you, uh, I mean, Katya there alluded to the fact that the country that is probably going to be the worst affected um, by cuts uh, would be would be Germany. Um, and that's clearly something that is weighing on the mind of, of the Chancellor and some of those in his, his government. On the other hand, there are other members of his government who are much more inclined to look at, um, you know, what this, what this funding might be doing to help Russia prosecute the war. So, I mean, can you help us to understand what, what's going on in Germany at the moment and who the main actors are and, you know, where German in industry stands in all of this? <laughs> Well, I'll have a go. It's a complicated issue, In uh, Thank you very much. Well, I think, firstly, Germany is having to face up to the, the complete failure of its Russia policy, as well as its ill-advised decision to make itself so dependent on Russia for its energy supplies. And let's remember that successive German governments saw this energy partnership with Russia as something that was mutually beneficial and therefore a stabilizing factor in Europe's relations with Russia. So what bizarrely happened in the end was that what was sincerely intended by the German side to be stabilizing, in fact, turned out to be destabilizing. And I think the, you know, the folly of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is a, is a powerful illustration. 
So Germany's leaders you know, thought after 2014 that they could reduce tensions with Russia by expanding this direct gas link, uh, even though it was going to clearly be the expense of Ukraine. Um, and they thought that you know, reducing Russia's dependence on Ukraine for the transit of gas would actually contribute to uh, some form of stability. Uh, in my view, they, they were trying to make some sort of virtue out of a necessity. They thought that um, you know, they, they needed gas as a bridging fuel, after all, because they decided to shut down the nuclear sector and move away from coal. But just a couple of days ago, uh, President Steinmeier finally admitted um, that his support for the Nord Stream 2 project had been mistaken and that he had misread uh, Putin's intentions. So some humble pie, at least, is starting to, to, to be eaten. The, the background to these policy miscalculations is, is long and complicated, um, but I think it suffice to say that the you know, desire of German industry for cheap gas supplies and then the historical role of the USSR and then post-Soviet Russia as a gas supplier, um, Kat has referred to that, to the stability of, of gas supplies from the 1970s, I think this played a big role in persuading German decision makers that they should you know, pursue this energy partnership with determination. Uh, and one would say to the exclusion of LNG, you know, the fact that Germany has no LNG terminals is, is the direct result of you know, government decision making. Um, the government also allowed Gazprom to acquire Germany's largest gas storage facility, as well as to make investments in the, the gas transportation system. Um, the, the economics minister, Robert Harbeck, um, the green minister, has, has referred to uh, his discovery of a pro-Russian lobby in, in his ministry. And uh, I must say that that equates with my experience many years ago of when I was working for TNKBP. Um, we used to go and, and speak to German officials in that ministry. And I was very struck by the fact that people I used to speak to were from East Germany. They'd studied in uh, the Soviet Union. And they had these very close uh, relationships with uh, with Gazprom, and they saw that as you know something that was really very positive um, for for Germany. But if you want the the view of the up to date view of uh, German industry, I, I came across a startling uh, quotation from uh, the BASF uh, chairman uh, Martin uh, Brudermüller just a couple of days ago. He said, "Why do we have Russian gas? It's absolutely not out of naivety, but because it was always the cheapest." And he went on to say the competitiveness of German industry was built on cheap Russian gas um, and, uh, and with it the strength of the, the German uh, economy. And he added that German you know, gas problem was for all these years a very reliable partner. Now, not surprisingly, the government at present is being heavily lobbied by industry um, and industry's position is clear. There can be no gas uh, embargo. This would cause a recession uh, and the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs, um, in particular because of the dependency of the, the steel and the chemical industries on imported uh, Russian gas. And, and we have this sort of mantra that um, Scholz and others have repeated that sanctions mustn't hurt us more than they, they hurt the, the Russians. Scholz, um, about 10 days ago in a, a long TV interview, he dismissed the, the modeling by some economists that suggests that an oil and gas embargo would cost only two to three percent of uh, G GDP. But at the same time, uh, the government is having to prepare for a potential cutoff from the, the Russian side and the, the Russian energy minister Novak um, at, the, at the start of the war in Ukraine actually threatened to, to shut down uh, Nord Stream 1. Uh, Scholz has um, stood his ground in rather sort of loyally fashion. Um, he is loyal by background, of course, on the issue of ruble payments. And it, it sort of ra rather seems as though uh, perhaps the Russian bureaucrats have found a solution to what seemed to be a very serious issue, uh, even if it's still one that involves the, the Russian uh, central bank. I think the striking development of just recent days is the uh, German government's decision to put uh, Gazprom Germania into trusteeship. And this is, I think, a significant step towards the, um, the unraveling of the, the gas relationship with Russia. Gazprom Germania brings together all Gazprom's uh, interests uh, in, in Germany. Longer term, I think we're likely to see a complete rethink of both Russia policy and energy policy, both, in fact, are long overdue, in my humble opinion. 
But the speed and depth of those process will, processes will depend on how long the war in Ukraine lasts and, and what its outcome is. But it's very hard to see a return to, to business as usual. Those LNG terminals, I'm sure, will be built on an accelerated time timetable. And I suspect we're also going to see Russia in the interim period keeping up the pressure on Europe uh, and on Germany in particular uh, by playing the, the gas card. I think one has to, to ask certainly about the future of those long-term contracts. Uh, will, will buyers be taking less than their contracted volumes? What sort of contractual violations might then be deemed to have taken place? So we have entered really a fascinating period. Great. I'll stop there, thanks. Great, thank, thank you very much, John. Well, there's a lot to chew on there. Um, Elizabeth, I think Katia seemed to me to be slightly skeptical that um, Europe could reduce its demand for Russian gas as much as it has said it would. Um, you know, John sketched out some of the, the political obstacles in Germany. Um, I mean, what's your view? Do you think it is possible to get to that, uh, that target of a two thirds reduction by the end of this year? Uh, and if so, how can it be, how can it be done? And um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, let's, let's start with that and, and see whether we can also get on to um, what, the, what the impact on the European economy would be and how that might be mitigated. But let's start with how realistic is it to get towards that target? Yes, uh, thank you, Ian. Um, so I think you know if you look at um, reactions to the to the to the plan that the Commission presented earlier in March, the, the Repower EU sort of timeline that suggests indeed a, a reduction by two thirds of gas imports from Russia and then overall essentially um, um, cut in uh, energy imports from from Russia by twenty twenty seven. Uh, everybody agrees that they are very ambitious, particularly the, the 2022 number, uh, which you know uh, concerns the, the uh, which which concerns essentially um, decisions that have to be taken immediately. Um, but everybody also agrees that we don't have uh, many alternatives, uh, and uh, you know to some extent, I think we're already seeing responses uh, to that, and we're already seeing. Um, alternative measures uh, being taken on the supply side, notably uh, fuel switching from gas uh, to coal, for instance, in, in the power sector, and to some extent also from gas to coal and oil in industrial applications that allowed this, uh, this type of substitution. Um, the, the, of course, the, the, the ramp up in imports of LNG is something that has characterized the past, the past year already. Uh, and there is obvious um, interest, and, um, and Europe has the EU has mentioned that it intends to to continue on on this path by securing additional LNG capacity, uh, which of course will come at some point at the expense in the short term due to you know relatively fixed uh, capacity that cannot be amplified immediately. It will come at the expense of. Uh, those countries that used to be uh, large LNG uh, consumers, uh, notably in Asia. So there will be repercussions, I think, on, on, on the global gas market that we, we, we have not, I guess, fully understood as of now. And that the, those will have repercussions in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, because if Asian countries that used to uh, rely on LNG suddenly have to shift to coal, of course, that will, uh, that will have uh, second order effects in terms of uh, in terms of emissions and in terms of climate impacts. Um, so all of that is, is essentially indicated as the, the short term fix, but uh, it's not completely sufficient to fill the gap that a cut in, in Russian gas imports would leave in, in Europe. And I think something that has been not discussed as much, um, certainly at that EU level, has been the role of demand side measures. So how can um, national governments engage and, and utilities also, frankly, because at some point uh, the, there needs to be, I think, also greater responsibility um, to, to be placed on, on utilities as the actors that interact with consumers. How can they engage uh, with consumers, be they households or, or businesses, to find ways to, to reduce and optimize uh, energy demand, gas, but also electricity, insofar that, of course, uh, the electricity sector does uh, rely on on gas for part of its uh, for part of its generation, and I'm I'm afraid you know partly the demand side solutions we we have 
in a way miss the boat on that in the sense that winter uh, for, for, for this year is ending in Europe. So I think there has been uh, a missed opportunity there in appealing uh, to the population to through a, a large scale campaign to, to try and find even if small scale on the aggregate uh, level, uh, large reductions and, and large energy savings. And this is certainly something that will need to be explored at this point, not so much on a voluntary basis, but unfortunately probably on a mandatory basis if we go towards uh, rationing for, uh, for next winter. So um, on the demand side, there is, there is probably a lot that can be done uh, and hasn't been uh, looked at yet. And, you know, two, two types of measures really. On one hand, the, the short-term behavioral changes but in, in the medium term, there needs to be an acceleration in energy efficiency improvements. And again, you know, both in the residential sector, renovations, installation of heat pumps, electrification of the gas uses on which households rely today, but also uh, quite massively in the industrial sector, helping the industrial sector uh, optimize its energy consumption uh, you know, as, as, uh, as quickly as possible, trying to find what are the lower hanging fruits there uh, that, uh, that can lead to, to some cuts. Because the alternative then otherwise would be um, some selected closures of, of specific industrial sectors, which would of course need to be chosen uh, with, with, with difficult political trade-offs in mind, because there are sectors in which um, uh, a temporary shutdown would not be as temporary, right? Because, uh, because uh, industrial operations may be damaged if, if there is a, a long-term uh, closure. So, uh, there needs to be, I guess, an orderly prioritization of what will be the end uses of gas uh, that, that need to be uh, kept online uh, as opposed to those that can be, uh, that can be paused. Um, I had, uh, of course, you know, other, other remarks uh, in mind as well in the sense that we have, of course, seen the, um, the announcement by the Commission for a for, a, for an embargo on coal, a proposal for an embargo on coal, but uh, an embargo, so I guess a quantity-based measure is not the only option on the table. Katia mentioned calls for uh, using an escrow account, uh, but, but of course, you know, that might lead to, um, to, to, to Russia deciding to, to close off the tap uh, on its side. Uh, an, an additional option that has also been pointed to by von der Leyen yesterday that is under consideration is the setup of a tariff on energy imports. And the reasoning behind that essentially is that attacks on, on energy imports would, would not stop uh, energy from flowing, so be it gas or, or oil, uh, but it would eat essentially into the rent that the Kremlin gets from energy trade. Uh, and, and the reason uh, it would then hit the producer and not re result in, in a full increase in energy prices by the amount of the tariff you, you decide to set up is that uh, Russia does not uh, have a lot of options to redirect all its energy exports um, uh, that currently go to Europe uh, elsewhere, right? What, what we say as economists is that the supply is relatively inelastic in the short term and there are a few alternatives that can be quickly um, uh, redirected to. Um, of course, gas exports by pipeline are, are you know, uh, for obvious reasons, difficult to, to redirect as, as pipes to, to China, for instance, are, are not as comprehensive, but uh, similarly, if the EU, together with, with Japan, Korea, Turkey, uh, managed to create a coalition of countries um, uh, interested in setting up such a, such a tariff on oil imports in this case, then they would amount to about 70% of oil uh, exports from Russia. And so it's difficult to think that Russia would be able to find alternative buyers for that amount uh, of, uh, of uh, oil. So that's, that's another, I think, important proposal that's, uh, that has been uh, circulating. Um, I'm, I may stop here and we can perhaps touch upon the, the economic implications, of course, of all these additional in, in the Q&A. So I think I'm running out of time. Okay, great. That's, that's good timing. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll get onto the question and answer. And can I just remind everybody, um, including um, Jordan, I think, that